Formal committees and communities of practice play the same type of role in an organization. They are both made of delegates who collaborate in a transversal way. People from similar functions but situated in different parts of the organization are collected to help make decisions on certain issues or serve certain purposes. However, formal committees serve better in situations that require a lot of preparations and involve a certain level of details, formal recommendations, and decision makings with supporting evidences, etc. Whereas communities of practice serve better in situations where the activities involved require harmonized collaborations, continuous learning, and improvements with mistakes being made from time to time. Currently, in many organizations, Formal committees are the transversal structure by default and cover the roles to solve the problems that should be better addressed by communities of practice. That's why there is the need of the shift from formal committees to communities of practice, although the purpose is not to replace formal committees entirely. Now let's look at the characteristics of the two. With formal committees, we see more formal regularly planned meetings with predefined patterns. Very often, the participants are the same persons who are designated based on their official functions and hierarchical positions, whereas with communities of practice, spontaneous and continuous interactions are in favor. That doesn't mean no preparation is needed, only that this kind of communication encourages spontaneity and thus involves minimum formal administrative effort. The participants usually voluntarily join the communities based on their expertise and interests. In addition, on the left part, formal committees tend to bring control and standardization. The issues involved are also more related to governance and conformity. While on the right part, in communities of practice, people are encouraged to share their expertise naturally and spontaneously which usually leads to the natural emergence of good practices and standards. Also, something isn't shown in the slide is that communities of practice allow people to make mistakes and provide a perfect platform for people to share their ideas online or face-to-face -face informally without the fear of saying something wrong. In contrast, formal committees cannot provide such an environment that facilitates learning and self-improving. When we talk about the communities of practice, we like making a reference to water. Water is like the information for running an organization. The practices, decision makings, various standards, etc. are all based on necessary information. Information must be passed rapidly around the organization to reach efficiency. What we need to avoid is to pass information in big chunks, and instead we want information to be fluid and easy to produce and use. As in the image, compared to the left part where water-like information is carried in big barrels from point A to point B with great effort, we prefer to analogize information to the rainwater in the right part, where communities of practice can make information pass around the organization fluidly like rainwater and make people to be showered naturally in the rain of information that is pertinent to them and supporting the process of value creation and the delivery. Just like water is necessary for our life, information is necessary for the survival and the growth of organizations. What are the components of a healthy community of practice? The principal components in the center are people, which can be divided into three major types. The experts, who have a good knowledge of the practices and still want to learn more and seek for further improvements. The practitioners, who utilize the practices and benefit from their active participation. Then the supporters, who have an important impact on the communities. Even if they are passive most of the time, their occasional opinions can be very constructive and help to bring the spirit of openness and identify new opportunities for the practices. Other than the people factor, the triangle of community of practice also has three axes. First, face-to-face -face interaction. In order to have a healthy community of practice, it's crucial to build trust among participants, which can be achieved much more effectively by face-to-face -face interaction. Also, face-to-face -face makes certain discussions much easier and clearer. The second axis of the triangle is online interaction, which is more useful in spontaneous collaboration and the rapid information diffusion among numerous participants. Then the third axis, knowledge base. 
why knowledge base? Because the purpose of communities of practice is to make people collaborate, to harmonize and enrich the practices, for which it's useful to have a kind of toolbox somewhere for the participants to make notes and have summaries. Now let's go one step further. At the level of people, when we launch a community of practice, it's important to have key roles such as the experts to dedicate enough time, like a couple hours per week, to participate in the community in order to initiate the community with enough momentum and develop it properly in the right direction with good discussions. Similarly, the communities must be well recognized and supported. Although it's not a department or a business division, it's an important part of collaboration and an official learning structure of the organization. Therefore, there must be enough engagement of the management, sufficient budget, and the validation of contribution to support the communities of practice. Then we have a physical meeting space, which is a base camp that may involve, for example, a whiteboard in an empty office room. We also have a social network platform. Which usually involves specific applications like Slack and Yammer, or maybe a big private LinkedIn group can work also. Lastly, we have the basic knowledge system, for which we must always seek for the simplest format to pass the information. It means that we should avoid creating a knowledge system that involves an enormous repertoire of Word and PowerPoint documents. Instead, we favor the use of multimedia that can include videos, photos, audios, or links, etc., as long as they are accessible and easy to use for all the participants. When we talk about communities, we have to evidently talk about activities. There are two axes for activities of communities of practice. One from online communications to face-to-face -face interactions, the other from spontaneous activities to planned recurring activities. In order to reach the optimal balance among the various activities, we need to understand the learning curve involved in creating a technique or practice for the community. For example, for the practice of rapid decision making, there might be online communications at first, where people concerned about the practice spontaneously exchange their ideas. Then face-to-face -face, but still spontaneous meetings can happen naturally when people meet in person to further consolidate the ideas and put it into practice in a pilot project. Following that, recurrent roundtable webinars can be planned to bring all the people sharing the same concerns or interests in the practice to the same page. After one or two months, face-to-face -face regular meetings and more formal presentations can be planned to improve the practice continuously. From the example, we can see that there is a natural learning path in the creation of a community of practice, and each type of activity has its own role and purpose. We have both formal and informal formats of activities. The learning path usually brings the activities from informal to formal form. When we eventually arrive at the formal presentations, what we actually do is reutilize all the elements. Such as videos, comments, and the conversations already generated in the informal activities, and represent them in a more formal way. Therefore, all along the process, the activities are organized naturally to make the practice for the community take shape and develop organically, and all the involved activities are oriented towards learning. We must understand that the purpose of communities of practice is to bring conversation as a main way of collaboration back to organization. Very often, a good 15 minutes conversation about work among three, four people in the corner of the coffee room, followed perhaps by an email, is more effective as a way of communication than a formal presentation with dozens of slides that took someone or some people days of hard work. After all, conversation is the most direct way of communication. Now, how to start a community of practice? Let's briefly look at the checklists, in which a few critical points will be discussed. The mission: almost all communities of practice involve the harmonization and improvement of the way of working. Sometimes also the tying up of agility to business or IT, etc. The subjects involved are usually transversal, such as agility, the governance. The architecture, etc. Then, of course, authorization and enough budget. We need both to support the communities of practice. Equally, core members' dedication to the initiation of a community is just as important. And then, a knowledge base. 
for which we need to gather existing content by using a toolbox such as SharePoint. In the end, kickoff and communication. What we need to do is to make it into something fun, creative, and at the same time, distinctive instead of ordinary. Here is an example of a value-based organizational structure. The organization in the example is ING Belgium or ING Netherlands, which has a very similar structure with many other organizations such as Spotify. In the chart, we can see the multidisciplinary autonomous teams called squads, each of which is responsible for a certain part of a product end-to-end. -end. Then we can see also tribes, each composed of a group of squads and represents a specific business area or a product line. And then what are called chapters and guilds actually refer to the transversal structure of communities of practice. Although chapters are within the same tribes, while guilds have a more transversal coverage, since they not only cross squads, but also cross tribes. But both of them are in nature communities of practice, aiming at promoting organizational innovation through cross-boundary collaborations. They are both made of people who share the same interests in the same domain and want to learn from one another to create new techniques or improve the practices in their area of competence together. Note that what is happening in many real value-based companies has proven that communities of practice as a learning structure have much more impact than a formal rigid structure in the traditional company. What are the strategies in practice for starting a community of practice? One strategy is to reinforce a community of practice that is in the process of emerging, since in many cases, quite some grassroots elements of a community of practice are already there like some form of communication online, some non-official information that's placed on a site, etc. What we need to do is only put them together and make them into a community of practice. Similarly, we can also transform an existing committee for addressing a transversal issue into a community of practice. Or we can do so based on a big transversal project. It is worth mentioning that when a community of practice is being started, the majority of the members in reality at the beginning might not be active participants. What they do is only listen and look. So it's important to adjust the activities and the membership conditions based on the community's maturity and keep a regular rhythm of the activities so as to keep the members interested and actively involved in the discussions. Last point, don't be afraid of being a provocator or agitator. The advantage of a community of practice is that, unlike in a formal committee, people have the right to be not politically correct. That is, mistakes are allowed, so people can say what they cannot say out loud elsewhere in the organization. So take advantage of it and be a provocator of the community to encourage people to participate in discussions and thus learn from one another, which will eventually result in the natural emergence of good practices.